Hey, welcome. I'm Pastor John Boyacek, and this is Fairview Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us for a slice of what Fairview life is all about. We want you to be here and be part of what God is doing in this community. I, I saw a meme this, this week. It says, it, it, was, it went like this. And then just like that, my pastor became a televangelist. And it just seems like that. We've, uh, things have changed so much. You know, life has changed so much this past week. Most of us are stuck either by ourselves or, or with our families. It's, it's amazing how things have changed so rapidly. Um, many of us have more time on, on our hands and, uh, because we, we just don't have people to be with or we don't have to attend any type of meetings or anything like that. The downtime has been good for many of us. And I realize that some of you are busier than ever just because of the line of work you're in. Uh, you're a frontline worker, you're, you're, you're a person who has to work, and, and you've been asked to step it up. And we realize that. But for the majority of people, things have wind down quite a bit. And there's a reason why our government has shut down everything. It's because this virus is serious. It can cause some serious challenges and complications uh, for people and for our country and for our province, and it has caused problems for our town. The fact is, this virus can affect you and me in a dramatic way. It can bring death. It can bring death. And the reason why we've reacted so much is because of the amount of deaths that this virus can bring. Another reason why they've reacted so much is because we're really not sure how this virus, virus will, um, will works. It, it's new to everyone. People offer their speculations, but there's really not a whole lot of science out about this virus. And we're not certain how it responds over time. It has hit home. It's hit home here in the Kortha Lakes. And some people have it and are seriously infected with it. And on a personal note, it, it, it makes me nervous as an individual. I have asthma. I know if I were to receive the virus, I, I would be quite sick. And, and I'll, I'd be in bad shape if I, if I ever got it. But the fact is, this world of ours has gone a little crazy. People are reacting in fear clearing out the stores of canned goods and toilet paper and, and other goods. And thankfully, those things are being restocked. They, they are being restocked. But businesses have shut down. Restaurants and retail stores have, have shut down. Travel agents like Susan George this past week have been scrambling to get people home and to cancel their future trips. The fact is, we're, we're living in a time of uncertainty. Politicians are talking maybe May or, or June when, when we can start getting back to some sort of normalcy, or, but, but we don't know what's going to happen. We don't even know if our children are going to go back to school on April the 6th. Conferences and concerts and other big gatherings have been canceled all next month. I'm not even certain what we're going to do about celebrating Easter. The fact is, uncertainty is the word of the day. The news reports give us uncertainty. Once they say the virus seems to be under control in this country, and then the next day they say the virus seems to be out of control in that country. And, and it's uncertain. And we really don't know what type of plan we should take. What's going to happen in the next few weeks? I don't know. There's a Persian story told about a ruler who caught a spy spying on his kingdom. And, and, and to be charged with spying within that kingdom means certain death. But the ruler of that country was wise, and he liked to give people a choice. He said, look, you know what? You're facing death here, so I'm going to give you an option. You can die by the firing squad, or you can enter through the big black door and find out what's on the other side. 
And when a spy is caught, this is what he gives them. And they caught the spy and he, and he asked them the same thing. And then as, as the moment the execution drew near, the, the spy was brought to the ruler and he says, here's the question, what will it be, the firing squad or the big black door? The spy hesitated for a long time. It was difficult. But he chose the firing squad. One of the leaders afterwards went to the ruler and asked what would happen if he chose the door. The ruler said, I'd give him his freedom. The fact is, people like to know what they're facing. People don't like uncertainty. They like to know what they're facing. Uh, re remember the story of the rich farmer in, in Luke 12? Uh, but part of the problem we're having these days is that we think we were in control before, but now we're not. We, we think that we were in control before, but now we're not. We, we say to ourselves, oh, I had this par pattern before this virus broke out. This is what my life was like, and now it's so different. I'm no longer in control. The fact is, we were never in control. We, we just had a false sense of control. Remember the story of, uh, of the rich farmer in, in Luke chapter 12, where, where things weren't going so well? Where, I, I should say where things were going very well. And in fact, so well that his, his barns were so filled to capacity. And he said, I'm going to build bigger barns. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build, build bigger gar, ba, barns. And that was his plan. That was his logical plan because his, his soil was fertile. But God called him a fool. God called him a fool, and all he lived for was his money. All he lived for was his crops. All he lived for was his parties. And his life was taken from him the night that he decided to build bigger barns. The fact is, he was never in control. He was never in control. Life, in general, is just uncertain. And these times have put a magnifying glass on it. These times have put a magnifying glass on it. And so this morning we're, we're going to be looking at Psalm 46. Psalm 46, trusting in the time of uncertainty. And if you have your Bibles, and I encourage you to have your Bibles, uh, to, to follow along as, as I read this to you and uh, as I preach from it. Psalm 46, this is what it says. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his vo voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he, and he shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let me pray before we go any further. Lord God, thank you for your word and how your word is truth and how your word is something we can trust in. And how your word speaks to us today. And Lord, as we look into it now, I pray that you'd bless our time. Just guide our thoughts. And, and may we understand you a bit better, even in this time of uncertainty, Lord. Thank you that we can turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this, this psalm, Psalm 46, talks about in this time of uncertainty and waiting, what do we do? In this time of uncertainty and waiting, what do we do? Well, verse 1 through 3 says this, God is our refuge and strength, 
an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and its mountains quake with their surging. God is our refuge and strength. The psalmist, first of all, starts off and he tells us that we, we need to have a profound trust in God. A profound trust in God. He is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Think about this for a minute. So often in our world, how often do we really need a refuge? How often in our world do we really need strength? So often in our modern world, we take all those things for granted. When was the last time you, you walked for days in the wilderness and you're saying, oh, if only I had refuge. If only I had clean, safe water to drink. When was the last time you, you ever had that thought come to you? We, we take those things for granted today. When was the last time you were outside freezing cold and, and you couldn't get a fire going, you said to yourself, oh, if only I had heat and, and refuge in this cold. We rarely do, like, do that, unless you're out snowmobiling someplace or winter camping. We have refuge throughout the time. We, we take those things for granted until something drastic happens. Um, um, it's minus 10 outside and your furnace breaks down in, in the house. And you go... <laughs> If only I had refuge and you call the furnace company and they come and they fix it. Or you're traveling with your family and, and, and the car breaks down at the side of the road. And you seek refuge when you call the, the uh, tow truck to come get you and it takes you to the nearest mechanic to get the help. You find that refuge. And this passage is saying that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. God is with us, especially in those desperate times. God is with us, especially in those desperate times. He's also here with us during the good times, but he's especially here when those tough times. I guess the question is, how often are you desperate for him? How often are you desperate for him? During this time, I think more people are turning to him. But the truth is, some people are quite stubborn during this, these times. On the heels of a devastating tornadoes that struck Oklahoma in May 2013, LifeWay Research completed a survey about suffering and faith in God. And here is, is what people uh, responded when asked, how do you feel about God when, I, when suffering occurs that seems unfair? Tornadoes seem unfair. This virus seems unfair. And this is how they responded. How do you feel about God when suffering occurs and it seems unfair? 33% said, I trust God more. I trust God more. 25% uh, said, I'm confused about God. 16% said, I don't think about God in these circumstances. 11% said, I wonder if God really cares. 8% said, I'm angry or resentful at God. And 7% and said, I doubt God exists. But over 60% of the survey response says that at, at least their interest in God increases when, when a natural disaster occurs. And, and, and many people in our society right now are saying, God, I, I need you during this time. And I hope you're one of those people. Many of your friends are asking those questions. What is going on? May they lean into God during these times. And so this is a great time to reflect and, and trust on God. Find refuge and strength in Him. This, this passage goes on that says, Therefore we will not fear. We will not fear. We will not fear. It's easy to say that when we... we and we don't know what we're going to be fearing. It's kind of like the child, the small child who's, who's asked during the daytime, are you afraid of the dark? And the child said, no, I'm not afraid of the dark. And then when the dark comes and, and it's dark in the house and they're just shadows, 
The child's scared of even a shadow. The child's scared of a little bump. The child's scared of a little noise in the dark. When we're faced with fear, that's when the fear increases. Therefore, we will not fear. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? One psychiatrist wrote this. He says, on any given year, 18% of North Americans will suffer from an anxiety disorder. That's twice the number of those who suffer from depression. If you broaden the study to include anyone who experiences an anxiety disorder at any time in his or her lifetime, the number increases to nearly 30%. Our levels of anxieties have also increased dramatically over the last 50 years. According to psychologist Robert Lely's book, Anxiety Free, the average American child today exhibits the same level of, of, of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient did in the 1950s. Material comfort and security may be high, uh, higher than it was back then, but other prevailing issues like separation from extended family, loss of community and, and neighborhood, Uncertain employment, threats of terrorism, uncertain futures, immersion in technology, and, and the lack of emotional support are few of the many contributing factors. As psychologist Ro Robert Lilly puts it, we, we live in the age of anxiety. We, we, we've become a nation of nervous wrecks. The psalmist says, therefore, we will not fear. And the writer gives a picture of what he is fearing here. He says, basically, everything coming apart. Take a look at this. It says, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. You get a picture here. There's this earthquake happening and everything's turning into quicksand and then it's just following into the sea. There's just nothing safe about everything. There is no firm footing. And he says, we will not fear even if that happens. There's a greater picture that the original listener would have heard when they, they, they read this, when they heard this, this psalm. It says, that God who we serve, Yahweh, the one who's greater than everything, the one who made the heavens and the earth. So often back then, they, they struggled with worshiping local gods. They, they worshiped the God of the rain. They worshiped the God of the harvest. They worshiped the God of the high places, the ones up on top of the mountains. They, they worshiped the God of, of the region. And the picture we clearly see is that all those gods in all those areas are destroyed. They're destroyed. The, the so-called place where those gods dwelt was destroyed. In a similar way, I think we need to ask ourselves, what has come crashing down in people's lives these days? What are the modern gods that have been destroyed lately? Maybe it's the god of employment. Maybe it's the god of education. Maybe it's the god of health. Maybe it's the god of travel. Maybe it's the God of spending my money because I have money to spend. Maybe it's the God of the stock market. We've seen this week that none of those things can help. None of those things can help. Our God is greater, the psalmist says, is far greater beyond that. He will help when everything else fails. What a great God we serve. So he says, well, in this time of uncertainty and waiting, what do we do? Have a profound trust in God. The, the second thing we can see here, uh, sorry, let, let, me, let me keep going here. It says, uh, a famous pastor in the past, A.W. Tozer, who died in 1963, he wrote this. He said, the man of pseudo-faith will fight for his verbal cree, but refuses flatly to allow himself to get into in a predicament where his future must depend on that creed being true. He always provides himself with secondary ways of escape so that he can have a way out if the roof caves in. 
And he goes on, he says, what we need very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know that they must do in the last day. What we need is a very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know that they must do on that last day. Folks, we're living in the last days. We, we, we are. Jesus is coming soon. He is. And you know what? The opposite of fear is trust. The opposite of fear is trust. Trust in God. God is big enough for your little world. God is big enough for your little world. And so in these times of uncertainty and waiting, what should we do? We, we need a profound trust in God. But the next thing the psalmist tells us that we, we need to seek in his protective presence. We need to seek his protective presence. This is what it says. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. He paints this picture. He talks about this other water. Instead of this water like Noah's flood that, that's destroying everything, he says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. This imagery is more about the Garden of Eden. This imagery is the Garden of Eden mixed with Jerusalem, where the temple of God was. In fact, this imagery is really developed in Re Revelation 21 and 22, Talking about the new heavens and the new earth. Saying, you know what? God has something bigger. Something greater in store for us. Eternity. A new heaven and a new earth. Something that's so much greater than now. What's the worst thing that could happen to us in this life? What, what is the worst thing that could happen to us in this life? We die. We die. And for believers in Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear. There is an eternity far greater than here that we could ever look forward to. If I get the coronavirus and it develops badly, I die. But I also get heaven. I get heaven. Do you have that perspective? And that, per per that, that, that perspective comes from confidence. Confidence in, in God. It says this, the, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God is with us. God is our fortress, our, our stronghold, the place that we can go run and hide, the place that protects us. This harkens back to verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength and an ever-present help in trouble. God is our fortress too. His presence I like what Pastor Leith Anderson said. He says this. He says, my family and I have lived in the same house for 17 years. We lived there more, to, uh, more than twice as long than I've ever lived in any other address my entire life. I sometimes refer to it as our house. But more often I refer to it as home. What makes it home isn't the address or the lot or the garage or the architecture. What makes it home is the people. He says, you may live in a bigger or newer or better house than we live in, but as nice as your house may be, I would never refer to your house as home because the people that are most important to me don't live there. So what makes home home is the people and the relationship. And what makes heaven heaven? It's not the streets made out of gold, the great fountains, or, or lots of fun and, and no smog. That all may be well. Actually, I think heaven is far greater than our wildest imagination. The same God who designed the best of everything in this world also designed heaven. Only he took it far greater, uh, to a farther greater extent than any of us that, that will ever see. Yet, it's still not what makes heaven heaven. What makes heaven, heaven is God. 
It's being there with him. With his presence comes peace and contentment, a fulfillment, a sense that all is well. That's also a contentment that bubbles over into the rest of life. We can anticipate this future in the presence of God. We can be with him in a place where everything he wants happens the way he wants it to happen. And that affects this life as well. In a way, we experience heaven when we focus in on God because he's with us. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. God is with us. It says, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Why does it say the the God of Jacob? For the Jew at that time, they they had a covenant made with God through through Jacob, Israel. It's their blood. But now he's extended that same covenant through a new Jacob. Who's Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Jesus gives it to non-Jews who believe. So in these times of uncertainty and waiting, what should we do? Have a profound trust in God. Remember and seek his protective presence. And the third thing is, just trust in Christ. Just trust in Christ. We're invited to look and see what he has done. It says this, come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. We're invited to look and see what he has done. I like what the theologian Eugene Peterson says. He says this, This command directs us from the small mighty world of self-help to the large world of God's help. Come, And behold the works of the Lord. Take a long, scrutinizing look at what God is doing. This requires patient attentiveness and energetic concentration. Everybody else is noisier than God. The headlines and and the neon lights and, and the amplifying systems of the world announce human works. But what of God's works? They are unadvertised but also inescapable. If we simply look, they are everywhere. They are marvelous. But God has no public relations agency. He mounts no public campaign to get our attention. He just invites us to look. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he's brought on the earth. What has he done? What has he done? In the ancient past, the the ancient people of God could look back to the Exodus and how God delivered the people through the Exodus and helped them to move into the land without a sword and conquering their enemies. They could look back and they see how he provided the judges to lead them and then kings like David and Solomon to lead. God has done great things in the past. Elijah with fire from heaven. Hezekiah and the the deliverance from the Assyrians. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in in the fiery furnace. They can look back and see what God has done. But for us, we can also look back in the recent past and see what God has done. World War I and World War II, they they were horrible events that that humanity brought on this world, but, but God saw us through. The Spanish flu of 1919. The the, the rise of communism and the fall of it. 9-11 and and those atrocities. SARS and and now coronavirus. He has a plan. He will bring it to an end. He brings wars to an end. He brings them all to an end. He brings conflicts and, and chaos to an end. And then he says this in verse 10. He says this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. The desert fathers of the early church, it was a protest movement against worldliness and 
in, just after the church started. They, they spoke of busyness as moral laziness. Busyness can be also an addictive drug, which is why its victims are increasingly referred to as workaholics. Busyness acts to repress our inner fears and, and personal anxieties as we scramble to achieve an enviable image to display to others. We become outward people obsessed with how we appear rather than inward people reflecting on the meaning of our lives. The fact is this time we're forced to be still. But are we? Are we still? We can still be busy. And I find myself being busy even, even when I'm not around many people. I, we can be busy doing things that really don't matter. I'm busy binge watching television. I, I'm busy going on social media and coming up with new memes for other people to read. I, I can binge watch on YouTube. We can be so busy with our phones. We can be so busy with our televisions. But we do we take time to be still and know that he is God. Don't wait for our communication systems and, and power to be shut down because of some other natural disaster that comes our way. Be still and know that he is God now. God is giving us a Sabbath. Take advantage of it. He's giving us a Sabbath. Take advantage of it. Be still and rest in him. A.J. Swoboda in the book, The Dusty One, says this. He says, there has been one day in our society that we have Sabbath, when we truly rested. There's been one day when we've put off our jobs, gone home, and, and just been. That was September 11th, 2001. On that day, all of us who could went home. We stopped flying. We left our work. The whole society rested. We called people where we were at odds with and, and we reconciled. Imagine what it would be like if we rested for some good because we are reconciled people. It's like the famous Yom HaShoah festival in the nation of Israel. For one day each year in Israel, the entire nation stops what they're doing to remember the Holocaust and its victims. Cars stop driving. People stop working. Gas stations stop pumping gas. Everything stops. And in a weird way, it required a tragedy to cause us to rest. A horrible tragedy. But that tragedy caused us to go home and tell people we loved them, to stop working, and to just be for a day. Like September 11th, Holy Saturday was a rest that brought about by a tragedy. And we rest because of Holy Saturday. The Jewish rabbi said that if everyone rested on Sabbath, the Messiah would come back. But, but the Christian story twists that. For the Christian story, when the Messiah comes back, everyone can rest from their toil. We no longer have to strive to become someone before God and can for once rest in his love. Be still and know that I am God I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time just filling your mind with stuff from the media in the next couple of weeks. Let me challenge you to take your Bible, take it out and read it. Uh, take time and, 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 and follow through it. Uh, read until you're blessed. Find a quiet place in your home right now if you can't go outside and, and, and just start reading. Maybe it's a chapter. Maybe it's a psalm. Maybe it's a proverb. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, one of the stories of Jesus. Maybe it's one of the epistles. Just take time to read until you're blessed and see, let God speak to you. Be still and know that he is God. I encourage you, if, if you can get outside and go walking, take your Bible with you. Sit by a river. St sit by outside in a park by yourself and be still and know and let him talk to you through his word. Read until you're blessed. Maybe it's reading a verse. Maybe it's reading a chapter. Maybe it's reading a book of the Bible. Read until you're blessed and let God 
speak to you. And as we come up to Easter, I want to give you a challenge in the next couple of weeks. As we come up to Easter, be still and know that he is God, but also take some time to, to, to fast. Maybe fast from media, social media. Uh, no electronics in your house. Maybe fast from food and just say, God, I'm just seeking you in this time. And be still and know that he is God. Seems like we're going to have more time to do this. It says, he will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. And the fact is, he will be exalted in the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. And don't wait for that final day when he will be exalted. Let him be exalted in your entire life right now. It says, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is verse 7 repeated in the end. The Lord Almighty is with us. The, the God of Jacob is our fortress. It's personal. He's with us. He's with us. Can, can, you, can you say that he's with you? He's with you? Do you have a personal relationship with him? The great God of the universe, up in heaven, where nothing shakes, nothing moves. He looks over us. He wants to have a relationship with you. And he provided a savior to come and, and live among us. To experience the same trials and hardships we experience in life. To, to experience the uncertainties of life. As a child, he... His family was uncertain whether or not Herod was going to come and, and kill him while he was in Bethlehem. Romans oppressed his people and he experienced that injustice. He had uncertainty because he had no place to lay his head. Think about that. He had uncertainty because his close friends abandoned him when, when things became tough. But he trusted his heavenly father. He trusted his heavenly Father. Each day he trusted it. But he also faced death. And he also faced sin. And he conquered sin and he conquered death. And he crushed them when he went to the cross. And he gave us away to our heavenly Father. And we need to put our faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for us. For him... We need to put our trust in him for salvation because he came and he died and he came to take away our sins. And what we need to do is ask Jesus for forgiveness. Say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned. You've come to take away my sin. Please come and take away my sin. I, I ask for forgiveness. And then we commit our life to him. We say, Lord Jesus, come and, and take control of my life. I want to follow after you. And, and, and you commit your life to him and you start on that journey following after him. And he will come in. And he will take control of your life and do a transforming thing. He will be personal with you. In fact, he's the only thing that is truly certain in this world. He, he's the only one who certainly rose from the dead. He, he's the only one who certainly conquered sin. No one else has. God is our refuge and strength. An ever-present help in trouble. An ever-present help in good times. An ever-present help in uncertain times. Find them as your refuge and strength. In this time of uncertainty and waiting, what do we do? We have a profound trust in God. We remember and seek his protective presence. And we just trust in Christ. We just trust in Christ. We need to keep doing that. We need to keep doing that. And may we find encouragement from the words of the psalmist. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this ancient truth that was spoken so many years ago that applies to us today as we're facing these uncertainties. But thank you that you are certain. Thank you that we don't have a reason to fear because we can trust you. And Lord, thank you that you're greater than our world. You're greater than my world. You're greater than our little worlds. And, and may we keep coming back to you time and time again 
As your word says, we're not supposed to be anxious, but with prayer and thanksgiving. And so, Lord, may we seek after you. May we listen to you. May we find that, that time to be still and know that you are God. Be exalted in our lives, Lord. Be glorified in our lives during this time. And may we rejoice during this time, knowing that you're in control. May we rest in that. Give us a special time of worship over the next few weeks as we're by ourselves, as we're secluded. Bless our time as we do that, Lord. Teach us new things as we seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you know what? We are a community that loves Jesus, and we want you to be part of this. Feel free to give us a call or even drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you.